Hello and welcome to Tuesday's edition of The Brief. My name is Gerard Rudnam. Joining me on today's show is our usual. We have Nordin Abdullah who joins us to talk about uh, crisis management. And this time around, we're looking at South China Sea. Uh, apparently, the, the war games continue or is beginning. And we'll also be talking about security assistance for Malaysia. He'll be delving into that shortly. A little later, I'll be joined by this lovely Dr. Noor Hafiza Mohamed Ismail. She's a senior lecturer for the School of Economics, Finance and Banking from UUM Sintok. We'll be delving into the EPF situation. She's got a lot of information to share with us. That's going to be happening in a while. In the meantime, let's begin with what's happening in the news today. Comms and Multimedia Minister says there's no significance for telco service providers recording one billion ringgit in profit if they're providing poor services. Now, he adds that while the 4G coverage in Sabah is at 86%, the internet quality in some areas remain questionable. Now, he recommends telcos to invest part of their profits to improve service quality for the benefit of the people. That's coming from uh, the comms and multimedia minister. In the meantime, the PM is currently in UAE for a three-day official visit, and this is to strengthen bilateral relations between Malaysia and the UAE. The trip will also work out other post-pandemic recovery efforts. Now, separately, the minister in the prime minister's department for economy says the financial sector must continue to play its role uh, in the sustainability agenda sector. Now, Topa wants to see commitment to responsible banking and sustainability, and this is in line with the Paris Agreement and UN SDG goals. He points out that the recent floods have shown how at risk us in Malaysia and the rest of the world are to climate change, and a transition to a greener economy must be accelerated. Yeah, and here's an important announcement from the Ministry of Health. They are calling for children, if you have kids, uh, to immediately get them vaccinated under the Pick Kids vaccine program before we transition into the endemic phase beginning April 1st. So that's a call from the Ministry of Health. And domestic uh, violence victims are advised to get medical report at the hospital if the police refuse to accept their reports under the excuse of it being a family matter. Now, Women, Family and Community Development Minister affirms that medical reports can be used so police cannot refuse to accept their reports. In the meantime, the Social Welfare Department will be issuing an emergency protection order separating the couple in the case of an abuse. So that's uh, just out uh, with regards to the Women, Family and Community Development Minister and what she affirms at this point. Uh, now to join me, uh, joining me at this uh, point every afternoon uh, at uh, on a weekday we have Nordin Abdullah. He joins us once again. I know I understand he's busy. Uh, he's uh, doing something with regards to uh, what do you call it, the digital space. But we're going to be talking about South China Sea today. Now uh, I'm just going to read out something for you, and you're going to take the story from there. A Chinese think tank warns uh, a rising risk of military conflict in the South China Sea following the U.S. Uh, significantly intensifying operations in the past year. Now, it's said that the U.S. has almost doubled the number of exercises involving career groups and stepped up other activities. The report also continues to say that many, with many of the drills, you can see there are dozens, of, uh, dozens with U.S. allies, and they're clearly aimed at China. So yesterday, U.S. and the Philippine troops began uh, a large-scale military drill or military drills in the show of strength as China grows increasingly assertive in the disputed South China Sea and Russia's war with Ukraine rages on. So a lot of things are happening. So um, uh, maybe, Nodin, give us some perspective on where we are with this. Now, is this posturing just to show, okay, this is our military strength? What's this all about when you whittle it down to a whole... Um, a small town mentality. So is this the big bully in town saying, look, you know, okay, there's another bully uh, here. Here's one. Uh, look, this is our might. And uh, this is what we have. And these are my friends. Is it akin to this when we look at the story simplistically? Well, Gerard, one of the things when we, we look at the South China Sea, it's an incredibly complex uh, geopolitical uh, strategy, uh, geopolitical uh, play, playbook. Uh, so what, what we're looking at is is now is is, is some of the, the people who are in that geopolitical game 
uh, are now starting to, to, to do a little bit of posturing. Of course, everyone is saying, oh, is this, uh, you know, part of uh, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine is everyone's talking about what will happen in South China Sea as well as uh, with uh, China and Taiwan. So having said that, there's also the, the, the ongoing uh, operations that the U.S. and its allies in the region continue to do on a on a, on a year-to-year basis. So, while uh, it there's sometimes the timing uh, may be uh, may be such, but sometimes this is just part of an ongoing operation uh, that happens on an annual basis. So, I think one of the things that we we need to look at is in 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 for Malaysia is what is the context for Malaysia. Uh, of course, Malaysia is one of the claimants to to different uh, disputed areas uh, in in the South yeah, China yeah, Sea. I guess that that's where our problem also is because you know China is one of our largest trading partners too, and uh, you know it's 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 really a very hard thing to juggle uh, looking at where we are with this whole South China Sea uh, issue or situation and our uh, uh, whatever trade or, or rather bilateral relations we have with China. So. Uh, at this point, with regards to where we are, you know, um, what 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 must we be looking at in terms of you know making sure that whatever talks we have with China or with this ongoing debate or conversation with the South China Sea issue uh, remains civil. Well, Gerard, this is uh, you, you've really hit the, the nail on the head here because what we're talking about is is just a military operation at the moment or military exercises. Uh, Malaysia, of course, has uh, very extensive trade relations, uh, not just with China, but with with all its ASEAN partners and the U.S. as well. So then you put the the diplomatic uh, uh, component to it, as well as the cultural component, as as well as uh, what we've been doing uh, in terms of, of developing intellectual property framework. So there's a lot to look at in terms of this matrix, and I think one of the things that we're we're looking at now is 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 also uh, the cyber resilience in terms of, 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 of any potential conflict in the South China Sea, uh, mm-hmm. because that's what we've seen uh, roll out in, in, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, that cyber will be the, the, the uh, forerunner to any physical conflicts. So, right. so, now, this is, yeah, so now this has become a, a, a more uh, a complex tapestry. Uh, and I think one of the things that Malaysia has been very good at is to ensure uh, right. Diplomacy is first, uh, and trade is not far behind. Yeah, we've got about two minutes left, and I quickly want to move into security assistance for Malaysia. The U.S. has approved approximately 230 million uh, U.S. Uh, dollars, which means it's, uh, nearly a one billion ringgit in security assistance for Malaysia since 2018. And uh, of course, this is among other things that have come uh, with regards to programs. Um, so. Maybe walk us through what this program is actually meant to do. Is it meant to help us or is it meant to, you know, what is this program all about? Well, I think in terms of technical assistance, the U.S. Uh, looks at, at uh, its partners in, in any any region and any country and then says, OK, what kind of assistance is required? One of one of that, uh, you know, of course, Defense Services Asia is going on it at the moment. Uh, in Putrajaya, one of the largest uh, defense shows in the region, uh, and it's of course actually happening physically. So it, it's it's a, uh, I think it's part of uh, their public diplomacy, uh, and and also uh, looking at how that they will look at managing some of the the intricacies of, of this. But in terms of bilateral relations between Malaysia and US, I think it also signals the good relationship that Malaysia has with the US. So, okay, so the good relationship we have. So we have a relationship with the U.S. and so does Singapore. They have a relationship with the U.S. Would that mean that the assistance would be same for both countries? Well, well, Singapore and, and, and U.S. will look at, uh, you know, they will look at the different uh, strategic realities there. Uh, and and the, the Singapore will look at their core strategic interests and say, look, to the U.S., look, this is what we're con- most concerned about. That will be slightly different than what Malaysia is concerned about. Uh, simply because of the, the diplomatic framework that Malaysia has is different to Singapore. So every every country, every bilateral, every multilateral relationship is different. But I think that the key underlying idea is how do we avoid crisis in the South China Sea? And and that, I think, is going to be the, the underlying idea in, in any uh, any of these arrangements. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Nordin Abdullah. There, He's got something interesting happening in the city. 
We hope to join him tomorrow to find out more about that whole thing happening in the digital space. Very exciting times indeed. Uh, Nordin Abdullah there. Well, moving on to what's happening in the world of business, the ringgit opened lower against the US dollar as the greenback strengthened further following the Bank of Japan's decision to buy 10 year Japanese government bonds. Today, one, one US dollar is four ringgit 20 sen. In the meantime, Bursa Malaysia remained in negative territory at midday and, and continued on profit taking in most heavyweight counters at lunch break. The FBM KLCI fell 16.49 points to 1,581.5. Or six. A quick look at gold from the stock market. We move on to gold. The price of gold today is 253 ringgit 14 cent per gram. In other business news, according to uh, the Malaysian ambassador to the UAE, there is an abundance of opportunity for Malaysian national companies to reach a wider global market through trade and economic cooperation with the UAE. And Bloomberg has suspended its operation in, or rather operations in Russia and Belarus over Ukraine, barring the country's users from accessing its financial services. Bloomberg claims that it will not be affected by the suspension. Now we move into our feature guest for today. Uh, this comes Friday, April 1st. Uh, applications for a special 10,000 ringgit withdrawal facility from the EPF will be open to all its members, you and I. Now, on board with me today is UUM School of Economics, Finance and Banking Senior Lecturer, Dr. Nur Hafiza Muhammad Ismail, to walk us through this withdrawal facility. Now, uh, Doc, thanks for doing this. Prior to the latest withdrawal, the government had already allowed EPF savers to withdraw up to 71,000 from the retirement funds through ILSTARI. There's also ICNA and ICITRA. As hi highlighted by the EPF before, this move now sees a total of 6.1 million members having less than 10,000 ringgit for their retirement funds or in their retirement funds. As of October 2021 last year, 3.6 million contributors had less than 1,000 ringgit in their accounts. Two million from this group are apparently Bumiputra members. What is the later? What is uh, with the latest withdrawals? Now, uh, how? Uh, what is it like for Malaysians? Will a lot of them risk old age poverty? Doc? Okay, Gerard, we know that EPF is a retirement plan. So the consistent uh, monthly contribution will enable the employer to have a comfortable post-retirement period. So with Malaysian life expectancy at 75 years and assuming EPF members start to withdraw their retirement saving at age 55, the saving would need to be sustainable for at least 20 years. So let's say, Gerard, if you have withdrawn your saving from EPF uh, through ILS Tari, I Sinar, I Chitra, and you are also planning for future withdrawal uh, to a special withdrawal facility. In total, you have withdrawn about 31,000 if you opt for the option one, or 81,000 in less than three years. Okay, so Gerard, you cannot invest in the future or have a comfortable post retirement period when your current situation is at bleak. So, in my opinion, Yes, the majority of EPF member who has uh, who have withdrawn their saving are now at risk of falling into old age poverty as pandemic related withdrawals has resulted in a significant reduction in retirement saving. So according to EPF, uh, the pandemic related withdrawals since the year to, uh, 2020 has resulted in 48 of EPF members having less than 10,000 in their account. So they need to work an extra four to maybe six years to cover the amount they withdrew and the loss of saving from the withdrawals. So, yeah, I do understand. We do understand that some of us are still struggling to survive due to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And some of them are also affected uh, by the recent flood that have been occurred in several states. So right. they need cash for the business recovery. So settling the debt 
fulfill the uh, the commitment. So um, EPF special withdrawal can provide a temporary uh, financial assistance to them, but it's also important to prioritize that spend the money to pri to prioritize and spend the money wisely because they are now at the risk of falling into old age poverty. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that if it's a must to withdraw uh, now, EPF members should come with a strategy to replenishing it later. Mm -hmm. Now, the EPF dividend rate should have been higher at 6.7% compared with the 6.1% announced recently if there were no outflow of savings by its members. Now, according to the finance minister, an additional dividend of 5.4 billion ringgit could be distributed to all EPF members if previous withdrawals were not made. This also has resulted in about 5.3 million members who have never withdrawn their savings through any withdrawal scheme before receiving lower returns on their savings. Now, the question is, are we going to see a further reduction in EPF's dividend rate this year too? And will EPF members who have never withdrawn their savings receive some kind of incentive for maintaining their savings? Doc? Okay, you're right. Although the three withdrawal schemes introduced by the government have allowed members to withdraw more than 101 billion from their account, this is not seriously affected the investment performance of EPF. Last year, EPF dividend performance recorded a 6.10% dividend for conventional saving and 5.65% dividend for a Sharia saving. So, surpass the 5.2 uh, conventional savings and 4.9 for Sharia saving in year to 20. 2020. So besides that, uh, the payout for the year 2021, which is 56.72 billion, becoming the all new high time total payout. So in my opinion, if this fourth uh, special withdrawal referring to the recent announcement made by the Prime Minister is the last facility allowed under the special withdrawal initiative and more eligible members decided not to withdraw the EPF saving, Yes, we can expect that EPF has a better chance to maintain a sustained, perform a sustained performance that will help uh, in the process of rebuilding its members' retirement saving during the economic recovery. Thus, there is a possibility that the EPF dividend can increase. But uh, we cannot ignore that the EPF dividend should have been higher at 6.7% just now, just like you said, compared mm -hmm. with the 6.1% announcement recently if there is no outflow of saving by its members so the finance yeah the finance minister has stated that an additional dividend of 5.4 uh, 5.4 billion could be distributed to all epf member uh, to all EP, uh, epf members uh, mm -hmm. if previous withdrawal were not made and yes this situation would be unfair to um, epf member who have never withdrawn their epf saving but had to receive a lower return uh, you know uh, on their saving so in my opinion maybe a special dividend rates apart from the dividend declared should be given to the retirees who choose not to withdraw all their savings in epf account so this one of the way to reward the EPF members and maybe will indirectly encourage other members to maintain their saving. Mm -hmm. Doc, my next two questions is about the finance minister and I'm going to go really fast because we've got about four minutes left here yeah, on the clock. The negative impact uh, from portfolio balancing by the EPF due to withdrawals by its members has caused the borrowing cost of the government uh, to increase uh, due to added interest payments amounting to 830 million a year. Now, the finance minister had this to say, he said the portfolio balancing by the EPF will give a negative impact on domestic bond and equity markets. Now, the, the simple question to this is, why is this so? Okay, Gerard, uh, portfolio rebalancing is important you know, to, me, to minimize the overall risk of the one's uh, portfolio to ensure the portfolio is aligned with the financial goals. But portfolio re rebalancing might be disadvantageous if it on, uh, incur costs highly and, the gain, uh, and then the gain earned. So due to the transaction charges uh, of, from buying and selling securities. So in addition to incurring more fees, portfolio rebalancing also yield higher 
taxes uh, from realizing capital gain. So besides that, portfolio rebalancing is in, in fact in effective when one investment cons, uh, consistently outform uh, to other to other one investment. So um, you know the new special withdrawal facility uh, of a uh, hundred uh, ten thousand for. 6.3 million eligible members will add up to a total of 63 billion. So to accommodate with the withdrawal or liquidity needs, EPF will have to sell its overseas investment to stop domestic investment in the short or medium term. So this will affect the overall capital markets of the country. So this unexpected increase in selling more overseas investment could have an impact on the local stock and also the bond market. So um, Besides that, I think uh, the the portfolio balancing uh, by the P, uh, by the EPF will affect the cost of borrowing uh, for the government. Okay, according to the finance minister, the government borrowing costs have uh, visibly risen with a coupon rates of MGS Malaysian Government Securities up hundred basis points. Okay, on average of the third quarter twenty twenty. So this, you know, um, when uh, that hundred. Uh, base point increase mean that the 83 billion worth of MGS uh, issued in 2021 and mean that the government has to pay added interest payment amounting to 830 million a year. So this costs an increase in borrowing, uh, you know, borrowing costs for the government in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Doctor, I, uh, we've got one more question. Very quickly, the government has invested a lot or rather EPF has invested a lot overseas, okay, to, to, to try to invest uh the the members money now the the big question is uh how will this affect the country's economy in general now that they they, they might have to try to sell or push some of their assets overseas uh out uh, the, the, the 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 big question is how will this affect our economy Okay, uh, Gerard, as the global... One minute left, or one minute. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> okay, as the global uh, economy recovers, Malaysian economy shows a very positive uh, growth. So, it grow, uh, the, the GDP growth is expected to expand further, you know, in the first uh, quarter. So, uh, and, I, and I am very confident that Malaysia is on the right track on achieving its GDP uh, growth projection, uh, projection okay? Uh, however, you know, uh, we know that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of us are still struggling uh, to do post uh, pandemic crisis you know uh, epf uh, but they can uh, withdraw the uh, using the epf special withdrawal but uh, mm -hmm. In the meantime, we know that EPF, okay, in order to accommodate the withdrawal liquidity, EPF will have to sell its uh, overseas investment, you know, to stop domestic investment and also, you know, to carry out a uh, portfolio balancing. So this decision to do uh, portfolio balancing would be a forward looking, a forward looking based on expectation about where the stock and bond market will head in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think. Uh, Okay, I, in the conclusion, I think, I believe that uh, EPF will manage its fund in such a way that members' fund are secured uh, to help members achieving retirement security and to reduce the risk of all poverty by providing, providing better dividend returns. Thank you very much, Dr. Nur Hafiza Muhammad Ismail from UUM to help us uh, walk through the EPF situation. From there, we move on to international news. A British trial will be investigating Pfizer's oral COVID-19 pill as a potential treatment for the virus as global cases surge once again. Now, scientists say the aim, uh, the aim sorry, is to find whether Paxlovid reduces the risk of death among hospitalized patients. Meanwhile, Syrian experts claim that media disinformation and misleading reporting on the Russia-Ukraine conflict reflects the Western media's fixation on ideology rather than truth. According to Muntha Rama, director of the Electronic Media Center, the escalation of the Western media's disinformation is evident of Western crisis forcing the media to sacrifice their credibility. And across the ocean in India on Sunday, they resume uh, regular international flight operations after nearly two years since the pandemic began in March 2020, that is. Uh, to date, 60 airlines from 40 countries have been allowed to operate, seeing a record-breaking number of passenger planning to, or rather passengers planning to fly, leading to an estimated rise in ticket price by 25 to 30%. Airport services are set to operate close to normal with air crew no longer required to wear protective gear on board. Now in sports, Kenya's Maxine Wahome emerges victorious 
as the winner of the first ever all women's rally the 27 year old finished the 12 kilometer race circuit in a Subaru Impreza beating her competitor by a sweeping 13 seconds she expresses her hopes that the race will go a long way in challenging the stereotypes of women's participation in the predominantly male-dominated uh, motorsport industry. Now, in the meantime, the 2022 World Cup has begun its preparation with the selection draw set to take place in Qatar this Friday. Qatar has dedicated billions in construction of a state-of-the-art stadium or state-of-the-art stadiums and training facilities in preparation to host the tournament scheduled to begin this November and December to avoid the heat of June and July. And post fiasco from this weekend's Oscar, Will Smith issued apologies to Chris Rock for slapping him at the Oscars after the Film Academy hinted taking action against the star for overshadowing the industry's top awards. Smith's actions has been claimed to violate Oscar policy and may result in expulsion from the organization, revocation of Oscars, and or loss of eligibility for future awards. That's a little something uh, trending with regards to Will Smith and Chris Rock's little fiasco at the Oscars. And before I end, let's see what's trending on Twitter. Uh, of course, Malaysia's Aina Abdul is back on the list after the singer received recognition from Spotify, mind you, uh, for having her image appear on New York's Times Square billboard. And uh, also, a uh, beloved badminton star, Lee Zee Jia, trends again with fans wishing happy birthday to the star, uh, which turns 24 today. And before I close, uh, for, from the brief, once again, we would like to remind all receivers of Sinovac to get a booster ASAP this Friday uh, because uh, we open up to the rest of the world and all of us have to be protected. If you're not protected, protect, sorry, go out there and get your booster shot. That's all from me today and from the team. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, right here on The Brief. Stay safe and thank you very much for staying with us right here on Banana TV.